Hello. <laughs> uh, my ending up in performing arts, particularly in theater, was quite an accident. Um, I was a very shy boy. Um, in fact, the reason why I ended up in theater is because my mother thought that I was too shy that she, without telling me, enrolled me in a drama club when I was um, seven years old as a, in, in first grade. I remember her coming home and saying that, oh, I just um, enrolled you in drama club and uh, hopefully that would help you explore, you know, like you, um, get out of your own shell. Her interest, I think at that time, was to find ways for me to become less shy. I remember being um, angry at her for for so many days until the day of the of the first the first day of this um, this drama club. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an elective. Um, it's an after school program that um, that, that we're doing. Um, so. I, this was one of those accidents that, um, that, I, that, that my mother gave to me. Um, and I, I think for, for five years, I never really liked it. I never really liked performing. Um, but there was this moment that in fifth grade, we were allowed to direct things. And that's when I realized, ah, there is something about theater that I like. I like organizing things. I like constructing things. Um, and, um, but it, this would go on that I would still actually hate acting. I ended up actually still entering an art school where I majored in theater, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a theater school where I still insisted that I do not want to perform. Um, is there a way for me to share um, my screen? Um, yeah. So I should do it, right? Um, I think I need to do it here. Uh, share screen. There we go. And let's do this. And uh, let's share it. It would take several decades before I would realize what was going on. Um, a big part of it has to do, in fact, that when I even went to theater school is that I was afraid to perform heterosexual white men. Uh, I didn't, it took me several decades to realize this, that one of my ma major insecurities is having to perform in real life and ultimately having to be at the center of everything where I have to perform these canons where the main character is a white heterosexual man. Um, so this would be a long journey for me to realize this. And I would like to invite you to a little bit of this journey that um, how I ended up with some of these realizations um, uh, and how I also ended up in a place where um, I find my own body on a stage um, here in Berlin, thinking about how do we listen. Um, I decided that to make this perform, that this little lecture to talk a little bit of my biography. Most of the time I am asked to give a, a lecture that is very theoretical. And in academia, that's very convenient because I could hide behind my words. I, you know, in academia tends to be this invisible head talking about these big theoretical things that oftentimes where the body disappears. We tend to read books where you don't even know what this, this person looked like. Um, so it's actually, this is one of those experiments for me to talk about, to be more biographical, to put this very body, this queer brown body in front of you now as a point where knowledge could actually emanate because this is one of those struggles that it took me decades actually to, to, find, to find peace or even to find my own, um, find my own footing. Um, and so I, I begin with a little bit of, just to give you an overview of wh wh what kind of studies I did because um, 
um, because at some point um, I might refer to some of these. Um, so I, I, I did, um, I did a, a theater school where I majored in theater and music composition, and I also did a bachelor's in art studies in the University of the Philippines. Um, I did, uh, in, in between, in 2007, eight, 2007 to 2008, I was in Bangkok um, as, a, as a lecturer of performance uh, and music. Um, I came to Europe for the first time in 2008 on, on, um, with a scholarship from Erasmus Mundus um, 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 scholarship to study in the University of Amsterdam, Warwick, and I spent a summer in, in Finland. After that, I also did a PhD in theater studies and musicology. When I first came to Europe, my dream was to become an opera director. I was trying to go to different theater schools, um, but I was also, um, but there, it, that seemed to be something so far away. It was an idea, but the whole, the whole, the thinking about who I am in this particular art form seems to, that there seems to be a big, a big um, hurdle to cross. Um, um, and there, but in between, there was an opportunity to do a PhD, and I and I decided to yes, I'm, I I I I'll, uh, I do want to research about um, uh, I do want to research about my region, about theater and music in my region. And in fact, the starting point of my dissertation, which is now a book, was a question about what um, about uh, the history of opera in Southeast Asia. Uh, um, but there again, you know, um, this journey um, would, would, would bring me into different kind of like cycles of, of coming back to certain places where like my mother who asked to, who forced me to do theater and now it became my profession. <laughs> um, and, and, and but certain dreams that I was thought that this was my ambition, um, I would circle back to it years later or a decade later, wondering why was it even my ambition in the first place? Who planted that ambition in me? Um, uh, and we'll get there. I wanted to just show you that, um, there's something blocking, ah, you see there. Um, yeah. Some of the, yeah, some of the performances I did, I, but part of what I want to show here before I get to my more recent work is of course, being in theater school, I um, even in the Philippines, I was working with the canons. I was I directed Shakespeare Midsummer Night's Dream in the middle of a mango orchard, um, <laughs> um, where I thought that the fairies could be more um, local encantos, um, and you see some of the um, some of the clothes that they're wearing, fabrics that they're wearing. Um, and later on, I began to start to question actually. Um, um, uh, yeah, performative um, questions about interculturality um, of how, how different performance cultures communicate with each other. The last perform I think the last production I did before I left the Philippines was an opera. I was directing a few operas at the, at, at the University of the Philippines um, College of Music um, Opera Workshop. And I did the Philippine premiere of L'Enfant at Les Sortilèges by Maurice Ravel. I'll show you a short clip.
Um, I shared this piece. Uh, this was because this was a, this was the beginning of some of the questions I've already started to ask. You know? um, I was thinking about the the um, this um, this huge presence of European canons that even in the Philippines they it has this this very this 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 big importance it, it's that, that everybody even when you when you, if, so even if you go to the college of music um to the conservative music in the philippines these are the canons that you have to learn um and i was back then fascinated by it and actually i i i wanted to work with it you know? um but i also was asking is there a way to engage these canons um and in, in this piece that i have i've shown um I decided, I, I just came back from Cambodia at the time, um, um, attending a workshop um, organized by the ASEAN, um, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So it's the equivalent of EU in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, I, 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 that, it was the first time I was learning about our neighbor. And I was fascinated, for example, finding um, older um, generations in Cambodia who still speak French. Um, so it, but at the same time, we I saw a lot of these um, factories of furniture where a lot of the um, furniture that we have here in Europe were being constructed there. So I decided that this opera that talks about this little um, naughty boy in um, in Normandy, I decided to make him a little monk boy, and that um, and in in the original opera, the furniture started singing, um, and I decided that this little boy was in the at the furniture shop of his father where the furniture started singing. Um, um, and, I, and back then I thought, ah, I'm, I'm pretty clever in thinking this, you know, <laughs> um, uh, about like kind of conversing with these canons from a particular place where I was, um, I was wondering how do I talk to these canons, but at the same time remind that canon that, as, because you, you probably hear that um, if, if the melodies of Ravel has, has some Asian qualities to it as well. So, because he would have heard um, the Cambodian music, which was their colony at that time, for example, in the, in the 1901 um, Paris Exposition. Um, there were, there's, a, there's a Pipat ensemble who came and performed. So, um, but this research, of my, this research of mine would take a few years later, or a decade later, before I would actually engage it. But at that time, I was already asking, what are these conversations happening, and, I, and how can I do this on stage? Um, and you know, coming to Europe, my idea is that this is what I want to do. I want to come to Europe and have that conversation there. I want to enter schools there and do that. But things, road, the road that I took um, didn't, wasn't a very straight path. I, ended up kind of leaving a little bit my artistic practice where, um, because when I, when I started my academic study in Europe, I realized more and more, at one point I even asked my doctoral, um, uh, my, my doctor father, um, when um, uh, we are, I'm doing a PhD in theater studies, when are we going to do theater? <laughs> and I was told, no, you're not supposed to do theater. You're supposed to write about it. <laughs> And, um, and that's when I realized that, ah, I, I might have, somewhere down the road, I might have taken a turn, and I didn't realize I took the turn, and that I might not, it, this will not get me to where I, what I was originally thinking, where I wanted to go. Um, nevertheless, I've, uh, I ended up, uh, I, I actually enjoy thinking as well. No? Um, it was just to track back, actually, after my theater school, when I did my bachelor's, um, one of my teachers told me that um, I was asking, what should I do in university um, after theater school? And he suggested that maybe take a philosophy course, take an art studies course. I think your art will become better if you also know how to think. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what I did. Um, and it fascinated me so much, art, um, art history and art studies, that it's something that even when I was doing my opera, I, 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 managed, I could bring together things that I, the things that I like to read and the things that I want to do on stage. And so this journey where I doing this master's and eventually doing a PhD wasn't too far off actually from what I wanted to do. And in, in the end, they're kind of still along the same path, but 
this this artist in me was had just was thinking ah oh, maybe yeah maybe I have to kind of give up on a certain ambition to, to do something else you know um, I would do I, then I would take you to a little bit of this detour um, uh, and hopefully we could circle back somewhere um, again um, to where I what, what to what I left in uh, more than a decade ago I traveled around, for my dissertation, I traveled around Southeast Asia. Uh, back then, I, I had just had a simple question. Um, wow, uh, I heard from my former professors that uh, there, there, there were opera companies coming to the Philippines. So maybe this is the time for me to kind of prove this because no one has written about this yet. So with German research money, I went back to Southeast Asia <laughs> and not, and um, it was, you know, it was significant enough uh, grant that allowed me actually to not just go back to the Philippines, but um, I traveled in different cities of, uh, of Southeast Asia. And what indeed was surprising is that if you look hard enough, you would find uh, materials about opera, um, European opera in Southeast Asia. So I came back actually with several terabytes of scanned documents. Um, and, uh, and when I started writing my, uh, my dissertation, there's so, much document, there's so much documents that I could have finished this dissertation in one and a half years, two years. Because there's, it's, it, if it's just a history of opera in Southeast Asia, it, there's so much that I could have e immediately finished it. But I had a crisis of, uh, of identity, even an existential crisis, two years um, after, um, during my PhD, after collecting archives and start, when I started writing, because I began to ask the question, what am I doing? This, this, it, this, is, uh, this question comes from uh, a particular place where a lot of things began to unravel within me, in my thinking, and my very place being in Europe. I realized that I could have finished this dissertation quick because if I have written this as a history of opera, the way that the discipline of musicology writes about history of music, it would have been finished because I have enough case studies to talk about it. But what is troubling me is that very framework. This history is a European history. And the question that I'm asking is that, is my job only a case study provider in an already existing history of opera? And therefore, here exists an history of opera. And my job is, oh, it also happened in the Philippines and Indonesia. And here is a footnote to this big entire history. And that's when I decided to stop for a while, I think I stopped for three months, just thinking, what am I doing? Is this what I wanted to do? Um, I was talking to friends, um, um, and, and there, was a, there was a moment when there was a shift that transpired. Because my question shifted from what, from the questions of what, where, when, um, who, because that's usually what musicology does and theater studies do. do. It, they, they collect the biographies, they collect the canons, they actually create canons, um, they standardize these canons and um, inject as much capital to this so that it also develops its own economic and political value. Um, uh, and I began to... Um, and I, I, I left that. I left that. Um, I, I left that question, and I asked rather the question: "But how were the Filipinos listening to this opera?" And that opened to me a different horizon. I do not have to leave my archive. I have enough materials that point to what canons were being played there. But my question is: But how were they listening to it? You know? Um, my strategies also shifted. Um, in the archive, I found 
uh, there's a d different strategy as well of engaging with this. It, it, it taught me how to be a co colonizer, <laughs> this research project, because I, f I have to find my question in different places. I, I f it, as, as, as a shortcut to, my, um, to answer to my question, I f most of them I found in the police department and the fire department. Because the colonizers are constantly controlling the colonized, that a lot of reports um, about how they are being controlled would appear in the police department. For example, of course, no one of the local Indios or the local native Filipinos could really go inside the opera house. So a lot of them would sit outside the opera houses and listen outside. Um, but then the police will be hired so that they will be shooed away. And, but that story would only appear on the police records. But in the police records, then I finally hear that they were listening. So this journey opened up to me another question that in the end I, pub I, I, I submitted my dissertation. I, I, it, it's been published um, uh, by Palgrave Macmillan. Um, you could even order it on Amazon now. <laughs> but, <laughs> But this opened up a different, um, I, there's a theory that I wrote in it. Um, um, some of you who might have, came, who might have come to my show, Sonos, um, I talked about my theory there. Um, it's also in this book. I might, we could discuss this later on if you have time. Um, I might discuss a little bit of basics of this theory um, because this, is, this was a guiding um, frame in, um, in what I would do from that point onwards. Um, after submitting, submitting my dissertation, I, and during, a journey, during a summer school that I was attending at the tail end of my PhD, I, um, I ended up joining a group um, of researchers um, who went to the Berlin Phonogram Archiv. This was in 2013. This is the Berlin Phonogram Archive. And I was surprised to see um, sound recordings that are 100 years old here in Berlin hidden in a basement of a museum that, no, that, um, you, know, that you have to travel all the way to the west, um, to, to the west end of, a, of, the, of the city and, then, and you have to know that it's there. You know? um, so I was kind of lucky to have been there and I was shocked at what exists sonically, what recordings exist. Um, so as a, as a trained historian indeed, like as somebody who works with the archive, this fascinated me. And this was kind of a link to the question that I was asking that um, part of the reason why the, the, the colonized disappear, their voices disappear in history is because while one, they do not necessarily appear in the records. And if they do, you'll have to find where the colonizers are keeping them, right? But at the same time, I realized that it has to do as well with um, literacy. And by literacy, um, you know, it's, it's, it's favoring one particular sense as a source of knowledge. So reading and writing, which prioritized the eyes, focuses on a particular, as a particular way of knowing. Um, so what happens to those who do not use this particular knowledge system that prioritizes the eyes? What happens to cultures that are producing knowledge using a different sense, such as hearing and, um, and, and sounding? And this was, uh, th this was, to me, fascinating to think that, well, there are recordings. And perhaps we also need to consider sound as historical source so that we could hear, finally, the colonized who disappear in history. And so I got my research project um, to go to, um, to research around Europe, um, collecting different sounds. Again, um, I was too ambitious and too maybe too optimistic thinking that, well, I have money from the Dutch Research Council. Um, I, all these archives, if I knock on their doors, they would let me in. Um, this would not have been the case. I would actually, um, it would be another journey for me to be even to be allowed inside the archives. Um, so um, it's a five. Year, it's a it's a four year project, which is now is the fifth year because it's been extended because of the COVID. Um, this um, project has um, allowed me to to see the archives and work with them. Um, 
at, at an academic level, I've produced some, um, I produced some articles. I've also produced um, some, um, asked some colleagues um, to write about the work they're doing about sound. You could see um, some of these articles in this, um, in this, uh, in these links. I also produced a podcast. You could listen to them um, where I spoke with different um, sound scholars, sound artists, for example, working in the region. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, these travelings that I did um, was, I, I was thinking a lot of things and, you know, in the end I need to write a book about this, uh, but it would also, uh, sorry, I'm using the wrong, uh, yeah, so I, so in the end I did manage to, to go to some of these archives, we've seen um, archives in the Netherlands, um, I, I brought some colleagues from Southeast Asia, so the whole idea of this project is to find recordings about Southeast Asia and to use this as sources in possibly rewriting uh, a way of thinking about the history of Southeast Asia from the ears, from the idea, from, 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 from sound. And we went to different archives where there are collections, um, and we, I asked um, some colleagues from Southeast Asia to come with us and do this, um, do this trip. Um, but this question of not, being able, not accessing the archives um, kind of got in the way. Um, so I, I, I went to a colleague of mine, Barbara Titus, um, who is the, who's an associate professor of, um, of, of, of cultural musicology in the University of Amsterdam. And I said, um, maybe we should ask another grant. So we, we started a new project called Decosias, where I realized that because these archives are not even accessible, maybe we need a in-between project to ask these to make these archives available, so that we could even could, so we could even begin to theorize or to even think about what happens to, to create a new historiography. Um, so the Cusias has started; um, it's, 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 it has just started. Um, it's um, it's just a little bit over a year old. Where this project tries to um, address different archives all over Europe. So we are now trying to bring France, Netherlands, and um, the UK, the big, um, the major um, colonizers, to hopefully speak um, with each other and think about how do we deal with these archives. Um, I'm speaking about this in passing to, to show what I've been dealing with um, um, uh, academically, um, some of the questions that in, in, in my research. Um, but what I would like to say is that um, I find it still difficult that all these questions that has been animating my, my, my thinking, um, um, I find, found it difficult that in the end, what I would do is sit down and write this as a book. This disappearance of the body from which these experiences of the struggle, for example, of entering the archive, or, um, or, even, um, or even asking the grant to be able to enter the archives. Um, and even the, the experience that I've had facing an, a sound recording from 100 years ago and listening to them of Indonesians, of Filipinos who were captured in this sound and listening to them in this, this physical experience of going through that, you know, um, disappears if I, if, if I just end up writing. Um, and the most fascinating thing, of course, is that, um, is that I suddenly went around and came back to the stage. And it's on the stage that I began to um, ask some of the questions that I could not ask in academia. Um, and at the same time, I could find myself uh, within the question that I'm asking. And by this I mean, uh, I think this, this is where now I go back to this circle where when I was young and I was shy to perform because of my, of the, of, of, of my identity, because I feel that the canon is, you know, the canon is composed of um, heterosexual white men um, that I will never be able to perform and therefore this is why I didn't want to do theater. Suddenly, I saw theater in a different way. That, in fact, actually, is not the theater also the place. It's not the laboratory where the questions of this queer brown body um, researching about this sound, not the place to ask these questions. Um, and not hiding behind the pages where 
as soon as the text comes out, my body disappears. Um, and so, and I was surprised in how, indeed, um, I'm glad that I ended up not doing opera directing training because I think I would not have ended up in this place where I could ask these questions now. I will come back to that in a bit. Um, Um, there are a few pieces that maybe I'd like to share with you, um, and then I the, the very um, there's a particular piece actually that's the first piece that I did at Ballhaus now in Strasse, but I put that at the very last because there are a few reflections that I wanted to do specifically with that particular piece. Um, Sonus, the sound within us, is uh, the second piece that I did at um, Theater Ballhaus now in Strasse. Um, the the um, Ballhaus now in Strasse actually approached me. Um, during my fellowship here in Berlin, doing my research at Freie Universität. Um, they specifically want me to perform my research. Um, and that was, um, that to me was, uh, that to me was exciting. No? Um, but it, ha it entailed a lot of um, confrontation with my, with, uh, with my own being and with, with, the, with, with, with a lot of things. And particularly because as I've said, I did not want to perform. I never liked being on stage. <laughs> um, but this, this, um, this request will force me to be on stage. And that was one of those things where I also, I, where I really saw the theater as a laboratory where even the, que you know, the questions that I point to my body has to be answered. Um, Sonus is something that I, I, I enjoy performing this. Some of you might have seen this uh, last year. Um, it, kind, it, it allowed me to not just talk about um, my theory of the Sonus, which is on, on my book, but really to perform it. And that ultimately, I think, is the whole, this is the whole point of my theory, that it, it is hard to talk about it on the page. It is something that transpires through hearing. And maybe this is the point where I talk a little bit about this theory and, um, and then we could, then we have a little bit of a grasp of it and then I could use it further in, the, in, in, in this little journey, you know? Um, there, there is this question, there, there's, there's this thing um, in art history and there's a, there's a theorist, um, his name is Hans, Hans Belting, who, who theorized that there is a difference between a picture and an image. Um, a picture is something that it, it, a picture is something that is mediatized. You know, uh, um, a painting, a photograph, this screen is a picture, um, and he creates a triangulation between a picture and then a body. That and then an image happens between these communications, which means that as your body interacts with the screen, it's producing an image. To make this even more clear. And to also show how this could be very political, um, there's a professor in Chicago where the beginning of each, of, each, of, each, of his class, he asks his students to bring, to take a picture of their mother and to stab it. And that's a very violent, um, we have this very knee-jerk reaction that this is such a violent act. Um, but why? You know, that, that is just a piece of paper with pixels. Um, that is not the mother. But that medium, the way that it, it interacts with your body, produces an image. And ultimately, it is the image um, um, that, um, that gives meaning, that animates, um, you know, the, the pictures, the sculptures around us. You know? And um, there's, there's many applications of this, of course, that um, um, another theorist would argue, for example, that um, the destruction of the, of the Twin Towers is because it's not about the Twin Towers, but it is what it represents. You know, how, how the Twin Towers, the image that it projects to a certain body, because everybody would have a different relationship with that. Right? So uh, an American body um, relating to the, to the Twin Towers would have a different image, and um, um, say um, people um, from, from the Middle East, from Iraq, for example, might have a different, um, or, um, or from Syria would have a different um, image of this, or even Filipinos. When I, in fact, when I first heard that in the news of the Twin Towers, I thought, I, which, which World Trade Center? Because there were many World Trade Centers. So obviously that image is not 
in my body. I, it will take me a while for this image to happen inside my body. Um, and this is the question that I ask um, about sound. What happens if we listen to sound? What, what, is there a relationship that happens with our body? So my entire performance is actually based on this. And, my, and this is also the, the theory that I've been asking about. How do we listen to sound? What, what's, what, what does it produce in us? Um, and um, I want you to hold on to this because I would be using this as, a, as, a, as an idea to, to navigate to some, of the, to some of the other pieces that I've made. Another piece that I did is um, the forces of overtone, um, which some of you also perhaps might have seen. Um, because my question now also kind of expanded in how, how, how do listening produce understandings, right? And, and in my engagement with colonialism, um, um, one of the questions that I have been asking is, um, on the one hand, is, is my work polemical only to colonialism? By this, I mean, Every time we talk about post-colonialism, every time we talk about colonialism, am I just trying to negate this term? And is there other ways to talk about colonialism without talking about colonialism? Can we talk about what is not colonized without having to talk about colonialism? And the problem with it is that here in Europe, all the, con all the conversation, we now have post-colonialism, we now have decolonialism, but the word is there. It's, so, it's, it's, it's at, at the very center that all we could ever do is add a prefix to it. So that all we could ever do is just respond to it polemically. Um, and what else, you know? Um, but I also wanted to shift this in other ways. In fact, um, so one of the th ways that I was thinking is how do we even produce sound? and. Um, um, one of the theory, of course, of sound is that when we're producing music, um, we usually use tones. And tones are, um, are particular sounds where we could narrow down a particular frequency, which means that if you, if you could say, you know, if, we, if, I, if, I sing, if I say, sing, do, then I'm, 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 I'm using a human skill to, to force the sound to only produce a particular pitch. Um, but by doing so, um, by, by we, oftentimes what happens is that there's a physics of it that we produce um, the fun fundamental pitch. So when I, sing, when I sing do, other notes are actually playing above do. You know? it's, it's just the physics of it. There are, the, the other things starts to vibrate. Um, and, um, and, and, one, and my question, of course, is that in, in, in the entire aesthetics of, of music, um, in the West, the fundamental tone, which is the ability to play the main pitch, while suppressing everything else that would normally sound when you when you play the main pitch, are actually is is what is uh, what is what is considered um, beautiful. No. Um, so my question is that is colonialism a fundamental tone, and that therefore all we could ever do, pretty much like the physics of things, is that once we sound a fundamental tone, which is colonialism, is that all we could ever do is vibrate in response to this. Um, so one response to it that I was thinking is that there are cultures that actually have a completely different relationship to tones. There are cultures, for example, that suppresses the fundamental tones in favor of overtones, such as the Tibetan kumi singing, for example. And this was a way for me to think about how to have this conversation from that perspective. I will not reveal too much about the piece, and I would invite you, because it will actually come back on stage um, in, in May. Um, so I'd invite you to see it. Um, so, these are the, so these are the journeys through which um, my question kind of developed um, into ways of how do I open my ears to ask the questions that I am asking from, um, from the, the particularity of my, even my own experience um, uh, as, a, as, a, as, as somebody who grew up in the Philippines and who migrated to Europe. Um, 
there's also a particular piece, uh, there's, there's, there's a festival that I'm now curating at Ballhaus Naunienstrasse called the Colonial Frequencies Festival. It has, um, uh, as Dorothea has mentioned, it has already started. These indeed questions, um, this, this is a piece where I, well, this is a festival where I also um, am very grateful that I could be the curator and also operate as a curator because I realized that the questions that I'm asking in the archive and the, qu the questions that I'm asking when I'm writing a book and the questions that I have been asking as a performer on stage um, is something also um, that we could gather together um, and ask other artists and colleagues um, to, to be in conversation with. Um, surely the questions that I am asking is not unique to me, but there is an in way, as there's a way that institutions, I've described a little bit about my relationship with academia of what, how I'm struggling with it, but at the same time, art institutions, the whole world over, and also especially here in Europe, are is structured in a certain way. Um, that operates at a particular level. And so the colonial frequencies started off from a question of um, what if we invite artists um, from non-European background who, have, who, are, who are already working with questions similar to what I've been doing with my own biography. But this time, what the proposal that we ask them is that what if you have to create a piece about your experience, but you do not have to perform for white ears or white eyes? This was just the starting question of the colonial frequencies. And this has something to do with, um, with what I have. This points back to that when I was directing opera, that I always felt like not only do I have to deal with the, this particular European canon? There is always an imaginary audience to which I have to perform, and that is the basis that there's, an, there's a particular way that ears and eyes are already programmed on how to perceive. And it took me, now I go back to that long journey where I, where I started off, that when I realized that these ways of perception is programmed into all our bodies. It doesn't even matter whether you're white or not. It's a programming of ways of understanding the world from a particular perspective that I was, that my young little boy, brown queer body was so afraid that I will be perceived from that perspective that I could not ever perform that, that I will always fall short. And therefore, this festival is a way to ask that question. What if you do not have to perform, to perform for that gaze to those ears? What will you do? It's not a very easy answer, though, because um, a lot of the artists that I've spoken with would say, well, that makes our life much easier. And then, and then three weeks later, we have a crisis. Indeed, how do you do that? The entire epistemology of our perception, our aesthetics is so programmed that how do we actually get out of it? And, and this is in a way what we're trying to do with the colonial frequencies that at the very least we should have a, lab, a stage as a laboratory to test things out. You know? um, and my quick answer to this as a historian now speaking is that certain aesthetics have, has had the capital and, and the time of like several centuries of kings and queens, you know, and state funding them and so that they could fail as well. You know, you have a, not, not everyone could be a Beethoven, but surely all this money that has been, has been invested on in this would eventually produce um, something that for those that will fail and those that, that, that will succeed. But, um, and this is the question that I am asking that what, what if, how are we shaping even our artistic institutions, our artistic capital? Where do we invest in it? Especially in these neoliberal capitalist times where everyone is expected to succeed, but success is framed within those eyes, within those ears. And therefore, if you fail from that, how do other aesthetics emerge? And this is at least the starting question that we want to do with the colonial frequencies. How do we test things that, if it fails, it's part of the process. 
because we do not know how to operate beyond this predetermined aesthetic framework so far. I now, um, um, I, I wanted to show this, um, but I, I, let me see what time do we have. Um, but maybe I'll leave this maybe somewhere to the end um, because this is, I just wanted to show this as a kind of an intermission because if for those who are online, you could put on your earphones. This, it's, it's kind of a bin oral experience. Uh, um, but I would leave it for a later, um, for a later thing. Sorry, Marcus. Marcus actually produced the, this, uh, the, the Hirschfeld version of this and um, he coordinated the, the staging of an actual stage version at the, at the, um, at the Museum for Communication. Um, it's a fun thing, um, but, um, but I wanna kind of go a little bit sharper with what I want to talk about. Um, so I now come to, um, to the first piece that I did at Ballhaus Naunenstrasse called Echoing Europe, where after a very long period of collecting materials, I was surprised that a theater told me, would you like to do something with these materials that you're collecting? And I knew I have a lot of things to say. But in the end, thinking about how sound, how, you know, thinking about sound and sound epistemologies, I actually ended up, after three weeks of thinking, what do I want to say, I decided to actually perform silence. And I, I want to show you part of the piece. Oh, sorry, this is not it. <laughs> Given the shortness of our time, I think I don't want to play the, this 18 minutes of silence to everyone. <laughs> um, central to these performances, it started really with 18 minutes of silence, um, which was, which, after having shown this several times, it's it's also interesting to do. Maybe I should say a bit.
we present to you an audio recording of his lecture. Our museum staff will be assisting in the demonstration of the materials. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, unglücklicherweise ist der Direktor des Museums verhindert und kann doch nicht zu uns stoßen. Er ist mit wichtigeren Dingen beschäftigt. Wir selbst sind ebenfalls beschäftigt mit unserem anstehenden Umzug in den alten imperialen Palast. Daher erlauben wir uns, Ihnen die Rede des Direktors als Aufzeichnung zu präsentieren. Unsere Mitarbeiter stehen bereit, Ihnen die hier ausgestellten Objekte vorzuführen. I would after having run this show a few times, it was always fascinating to do a bit of et um, ethnography, like a kind of research what the audience, about what the audience felt, what the audience saw or experienced. And what is always interesting is that um, I would, for example, even in where I am performing, I could hear those who starts doing like <coughs> clicking their tongues in the audience area or kind of making sounds. Um, but a lot of times there are particular identities who actually start doing this um, from, from, from the stage manager or sometimes the, the dramaturg who kind of observes it. They would say that most of the time these are men who do this, like who, who can't stand silence so they need to make their own sound. And the fascinating thing is that I would speak to women and especially, um, especially women of color where they would say, when they hear this, they would say, huh, interesting. Well, it doesn't bother me because it's a place that I'm so used to, being silenced. Um, so so even, even when we perform silence, we, when I did this, I did not expect that certain social dramaturgies, as I call it, are revealed of like, how do we operate now? Um, and so the, the, in collecting these sound objects and displaying them on stage, um, um, I did not expect um, I did not expect this um, as as, uh, you know, as as what even for me would be revealed. In the piece, I also um, was thinking about how uh, history is a loop, you know, and then this is part of the reason why in this piece I created this gigantic loop where all the recordings that I have gathered are put in a loop that goes round and round um, on stage. Um, but part of, the, part of the idea is this entrapment of m our own particular bodies inside the loop because um, this whole idea as well that sounds, you know, in my research I, I realized that many of these recordings are in Berlin, um, but many of the bodies whom were recorded were not allowed to come to Europe. So, this, so how this politics, um, and I think this is now, we open up, and this, this, is, a, this is part of the journey as well now to the post-migrant, no? um, of what discourses come, define, um, um, or how do we talk about migration? You know? um, and, 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 I, and, and I call it the post-migrant listening, is because particularly, in the, in the first place, that while doing this work, I noticed how certain recordings are allowed to migrate, but bodies are not. And what logic um, governs this? Um, and, and, and in this performativity as well, this whole idea that um, recordings don't have passports and visas, but bodies do, right? Um, are, are at least controlled by visas. Um, is this, uh... And a question that I found myself at after doing this research, after having this PhD from Ludwig Maximilian's University, have, after, receive, you know, after receiving some award from the Dutch Research Council and having a position in the university in Amsterdam, doing work um, here in Berlin, which was something to celebrate that I really, really enjoyed, I found myself as well in a place where, um, where as I was presenting my, rec my research of, of these recordings that are here in Berlin from my own culture and trying to um, disclose it 
um, to the European public. The question now that I ended up asking is how am I not, how have I not just become a colonizer? How have I that, how have I not embodied after being trained into this system, into this epistemic system, into this system that has its own habits and habitus of doing things. How have I not just become somebody who would profit from cultural materials of my own culture by displaying them in Europe? And this was this, um, this painful realization that at the end of this piece, I this postcard that you see in the background, which is from 1914, when the first recording was done in one of the tribes in the Philippines, I replicate this as the very question that I asked, that how has this body also just become another, um, how, 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 how has this body could become also a colonizer? And therefore, we, here I realized that the intersections of, you know, we ask this in the questions of feminism, that where is the masculine, where is the feminine? And of course, it, there is a very thin line that, that all these things are constantly overlapping and, um, and, and that power relationships and hegemonies are constantly crossing lines depending on intent, right? And it's the same, and this is where, this is where our questions are, be, our question, critical questions should be animated, that I do not have to be white to behave in colonial terms. Colonialism is a behavior, it is an episteme of extraction uh, that, that certain cultures have have benefited from extracting from other free, from free labor of certain bodies and from extracting cultures of other people so that they could create capital, economic, political, ideological. Um, and I have become a victim of that, my own culture, but if I do not watch it, I could acquire the same habitus. I could perform the same extractivism of my own culture so that I could benefit from this. And therefore the question is, in true decolonialism, how can we interrupt this? What is it from these habits that we grow up with, should we critically reflect on and interrupt? And that Part of this, of course, um, entails all these questions of, of migration, of my body moving to Europe. But, um, but ultimately, this is also the, this, this, this question that, I, that, that, that we ask at the Atterbach House Naunenstrasse. The Atterbach House Naunenstrasse is also a particular theater in Berlin, and probably in the entire Europe, that is engaging with the questions of post-migration. Um, and, you know, um, there are many ways of these discourses have been engaged with. It has already at least 25 years of history of thinking about this aesthetics. Um, it started off with a question that um, um, the, 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 the migrant um, um, population, for example, in Germany who have never been, who are particularly the Turkish and the Moroccan who, have, who came here as guest workers, um, who, who are third, you know, who become third generations, but will never, are, are never able to perform particular roles um, in, 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 majors, in, in big theater houses. Um, so it, 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 it began with a question of, but how do we imagine um, um, the migrants and we go beyond the, the identities of post-migration towards how do we, how could this be the starting point of stories? That their, that their roles is not just to emulate German stories being embedded on brown bodies, but question, but, but question how is this, this, their story of migration become the starting point of a new conversation of a Germany that actually embraces its history of migration and not just keeps pushing it under the rug. But of course, 20, uh, this discourse expands into the way that I am now, both as a curator and an artist, is engaging with the question of, to begin with, um, this was my research. I saw that in the 19th century, um, these concepts of nation, nationalism, of Filipino, you know, in, in, in my book, the concept, the, I cannot call 
the musicians that I'm dealing with, Filipinos, because at that time the word Filipinos are only Spanish who are born in the Philippines. If you are from the, if you're a native of Philippines, you're called Indio, an Indian, you know, and all, all colonizers called the locals Indians. So even in the Philippines, we were thought of as Indians. Um, so these terms kind of fall flat. These questions of who are, where are you from constantly fall flat because every time we ask these questions, we imagine that there is a place of centeredness. Um, but the entire world is the entire history of human is a history of migration. But who gets to tell that narrative of migration though? Because um, what is interesting, for example, is in the Netherlands, um, those who come from non-European background, non-white background coming to, um, to the Netherlands are, cons are sometimes called chalukzukers or like lock seekers. Um, but what difference does that make, you know, from say the Dutch who in, in the national history of the Netherlands um, traveled in the 17th century to the East Indies so that they could build the wealth of that country, which is still considered now, you know, in, 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 it, it, this is now one of the biggest conversation happening. Um, that this particular history that of, of colonialism is actually the same history that celebrates the beginning of the wealth of that country. And therefore, um, what difference therefore is, are, are, are these European travelers so that seeking luck somewhere else so that they could bring the wealth to their country? And how different is that from somebody who's doing the same coming to Europe? Like, what is the difference? Is, and obviously, it, it, it only points to the fact that, well, they are white, they're European, so they could tell that story that they are expats. Because the entire history so far that we have now is a European history. And therefore, if a European travels to the Philippines, which with, without any visa most of the time, it's, the, it's a destiny. It's, 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 it's something that, is, that, is, that, is, that, that the entire history has written so that, it, that, that this could be, um, this, that this narrative could be told in this way, that it's okay, but if I come here, then I am a migrant. But most of my colleagues who are German in there are expats. So, so even this narrative of migration, of course, has its own racialized and it's embedded in, in the long history of colonialism. And, and this overarching narrative, of course, still echoes. And, and this is the question that we are asking on, this, on the stage and on, on the colonial frequencies and, 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 the, and, the, and these performativities that, and these performances that I'm creating. How could we imagine a world where it's, we enter a post-migrant world? where if we stop talking about this discourse from that perspective that, that, that is Eurocentric, our question now is how has the world transformed by these migrations that, we, that sometimes we, 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 we disappear and that we constantly control? What, how, can we re, how can we look and we rewrite an entire, what we call the global history from that perspective? It's not centered on because the Europeans migrated there, but that it, that it is a, that if, if things are horizontal and therefore other migrations are part of what shape this entire global history where we are all part of now. Um, so this is kind of like my very quick jump into the term post-migrant that, um, that is part of, I think, um, um, the theme of the course that um, Marion and Thursday are are teaching and uh, this is where I position myself as well in my thinking. Um, I just w w kind of want to end with this thought and I want to end with a short video and I want to leave some of the, um, some of the further discussions maybe um, after this. I just wanted to show the last scene um, and this is a, of, of echoing Europe. Das Museum hat darüber hinaus mit der Linz-Pop-Ingels zusammengearbeitet. Historische Tonaufzeichnungen aus den Archiven, 
gehen in eine eigens kreierte interaktive Soundinstallation ein. Die Gangmaschine ist auf der Westseite der Gallery. Seien Sie so frei, die verschiedenen historischen Gelenke Südostasiens zu erkunden und zu genießen. Thank you.